Good morning. I'm Lorelei Rosenthal, a longtime congregant, a past president, and a member of the Imagine the Possible Executive Committee. And I'm delighted to host this morning's presentation of the origins and impact of Minoru Yamasaki's landmark North Shore Congregation Israel. We'll be gaining insight into how and why the leadership of NSCI at that time chose Minoru Yamasaki as the architect to design their new home on the lake and to learn about the features of the sanctuary from Dr. Samuel Gruber. Dr. Gruber is an internationally recognized expert on Jewish art, architecture, and the historic preservation of Jewish sites and monuments. He is president of the International Survey of Jewish Monuments and a lecturer in Jewish studies at Syracuse University. He has authored numerous publications, including The American Synagogue, A Century of Architecture and Jewish Community. NSCI is on the cover and prominently featured in the book. Sam has visited NSCI on numerous occasions. At the conclusion of Sam's presentation, Randy, Rabbi Wendy Giffen, Geffen will give remarks on our future needs and the importance of the Imagine the Possible campaign. Rabbi Geffen will be followed by Matt Wiley, a principal at Eckenhoff Sanders Architects. Matt and his team were selected by our current leadership to help us reimagine how our facility can best serve current and future generations. Matt will share draft renderings for renovated and reimagined spaces as part of the Imagine the Possible campaign. If you have questions for Dr. Gruber or the other panelists, please place them in the Q&A in the chat and we will get back to you. Now, it is my honor to introduce Professor Samuel Gruber. Hello, uh, let me just make sure that the uh, slides are working and they're not, so I'm going to do a new share, just one second. Again, yes, okay. Hello, and I'm glad to join you and to speak about one of my favorite uh, synagogues in the United States. In fact, one of my favorite uh, houses of worship in, uh, in America. It is a pleasure to investigate a bit of the history of this building, which I know mostly as a uh, contemporary uh, standing work. Um, and it takes me back to when I first met North Shore Congregation Israel, so to speak, uh, more than 20 years ago when I was preparing uh, the book that was just mentioned, American Synagogues, A Century of Architecture and Jewish Community that you see here. Um, and I knew nothing about modern American synagogues uh, because I'd spent most of my uh, career in looking at Jewish art and architecture in uh, looking at European and, and older, uh, both remnants and, and existing structures. Uh, but when I was asked to write this book, I uh, looked for the most notable structures and quickly, of course, discovered Yamasaki's uh, great work and your great sanctuary and uh, came to visit and fell in love. Uh, most recently, just in the pandemic earlier this year, a new book has come out, a big book called Synagogues, Marvels of Judaism, in which I have a chapter. And again, I was happy to uh, discuss uh, briefly uh, some of the architectural uh, qualities and uh, the significance of this, uh, of this great work. Uh, you, of course, know it as, uh, as home, but many people around the world mostly know it from images because not everyone makes the pilgrimage to Glencoe. Um, and the images, of course, are very striking. It is a, a very photogenic uh, building, and um, it was intentionally so. 
Uh, this was not a project that the congregation set out to do in a haphazard way. Uh, Rabbi Siskin, who was the driving force in this reinvention of the congregation, uh, thought from the beginning that, uh, as he said, uh, the congregation could build a landmark in religious architecture, and it could be a real contribution to uh, Jewish, Jewish structures uh, uh, in history and, and around the world. Uh, he reviewed architects and architecture. He himself was a practicing PhD anthropologist as well as a rabbi. Uh, he was deeply involved and committed to Judaism, but he was acutely aware of developments in the secular cultural world. And he wanted this new uh, building for a growing congregation, really a uh, rapidly expanding congregation through the 1950s uh, to make a statement, to make a mark and to be seen and also to be remembered uh, for generations going forward. Um, I think he's achieved this, although uh, the building process wasn't always easy. And of course, maintaining this giant structure made of new materials uh, with new technologies uh, for, a new, for a new congregation uh, hasn't always been easy. Of course, it's received a lot of uh, use, I gather, during the pandemic uh, because its large space allows easy uh, social distancing. And it's great to see uh, that a space now almost 60 years old can be uh, adapted in new ways. Um, what is this? What is this building? We think of it in many ways. Um, it is a landmark of Jewish architecture, a landmark of religious architecture, as we'll discuss. Uh, but I've heard it called many things, uh, mostly positive. Not, not everyone loves it, but, but I think most architects love it. And uh, most congregate, congregants over the years uh, have also admired the structure. Um, sometimes it's called a cathedral synagogue. What is a cathedral synagogue? There is no such thing. Of course, cathedrals are, are uh, Christian uh, seats of bishops, the cathedra. We don't have them in Judaism because we are congregational and therefore synagogues spring up all over. Uh, and congregations move from place to place on their own volition. They don't need a bishop or a pope to uh, give them permission. Still, when we think of cathedral synagogues, we think of the grand, big, expensive, and um, uh, fashionable synagogues like Temple Emmanuel in New York, um, and uh, they set the standard. And Temple Emmanuel was the last big synagogue erected just before the Great Depression. It was completed actually in 1930. Um, and it really marks the end of an era of big building in America that only picks up again in the late 1950s and 1960s. And North Shore Congregation Israel is part of that new phase of building. But now instead of being in the center of cities, many of these grand new uh, synagogues that people want to dub because of their size and magnificence, cathedral synagogues, um, are on the periphery or in the new suburbs, serving uh, younger and uh, expanding baby boom uh, populations. So here's a real cathedral, that's Chart. There's a faux cathedral, that's Temple Emmanuel, and there's uh, the synagogue in the temple in Glencoe. Uh, it's really a very different animal. Uh, so we won't think of it that way. Speaking of animals, I've also heard it referred to as looking like a giant bleached whale skeleton washed up on the shores of Lake Michigan. I like that image, and I was happy to find this image from Santa Barbara, California of a great whale skeleton. And, and really, it does have something of that uh, primordial or, or natural um, uh, elegance and simplicity that we that we see in the form. But there are other natural forms that come into play in this design. And I just show you a picture of a calla lily there. And we'll come back to that because certainly the flower motif, uh, even in this big concrete building, kind of pushes forward. And you can see it in these uh, in the arches where they come together on the um, uh, corners of the building. Uh, they, they do seem like the 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 petals of a, of a lily uh, spreading. And we'll see that again uh, in, the, in the arc. Now, uh, for Jews, uh, the building has a lot of meaning and symbolism. And it's not clear that this was ever um, uh, 
uh, the intent of the architect, Minoru Yamasaki, though Rabbi Siskin and, and others might have suggested these things. When I first saw the building, I thought, aha, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, because the tabernacle was the first home of wandering Jews, and these Jews had broken off significantly from Temple Sinai and set up a new, a new uh, uh, congregation on the North Shore. Um, but the tabernacle was surrounded by a, a perimeter fence, which had 60 posts and uh, it was a modular arrangement. And then inside was the Holy of Holies, the tabernacle uh, with the, with the uh, Holy Ark. And there was something about the structure, the modular structure of North Shore that suggested the tabernacle to me. And the tabernacle has always been uh, very uh, dominant in Jewish thought and particularly prominent in the mind of Jewish architects. And on the right here, you see a print by a 17th century Dutch, uh, Portuguese Dutch rabbi, uh, Jacob Judah Leon, in which he attempts to uh, recreate what the tabernacle uh, might have looked like. And architects continually go back to that image. Some architects go back to the temple, some images go back to um, uh, historical synagogues from antiquity in the Middle Ages, and we'll discuss that shortly. Um, now, Yamasaki himself said, I had not designed a large religious structure before and therefore was very interested in the challenge presented by this building. And he attended a high holidays service. So he was, he became Jewishly educated. Um, this is something that Rabbi Siskin himself wanted his own congregation to do more because when he came to North Shore Congregation Israel, he was very dismayed at the Jewish illiteracy of many of the Jews that he encountered. He found they were much more, had much more religious devotion going to the country club than to the synagogue. And many of them didn't even know who uh, essential Jewish characters from history like Joshua were and what they had done. And he said about through the 1950s in uh, expanding Jewish education and for children and for adults, and really trying to re-engage the congregation in a sense of community. And so not only did he want a temple that was going to be a landmark in Jewish or religious architecture, but he wanted a mishkan in the sense, a tent of meeting, a place that would bring people together to create community. And I think that was what he was looking for in one way when he set out uh, with the building committee to to choose an architect. Now, I just want to say uh, this idea of the tabernacle was uh, was current in the age. This is a, a synagogue by uh, contemporary architect Percival Goodman, the most prolific synagogue architect of his day, and he designed was designing just at this time the uh, the the building down the road at uh, North Suburban. Uh, and that may be one reason why he wasn't considered as an architect for North Shore. And you can see this kind of modular form and the concrete uh, supports, uh, you know, suggest something of that tabernacle too, although the effect is very, very different from, from North Shore. And then the, um, the, in some ways, the model, but also the antithesis for Yam Yamasaki's modular arrangement is found in the architecture of Mies van der Rohe, who, who was resident in Chicago and basically became the dean of Chicago architecture and to some extent, American architecture in the post-war period. And his work at ITT, IT, uh, like Crown Hall here, was the epitome of a kind of clean, clear uh, rationalism uh, with a modular style. Now, Yamasaki, because of the means of his construction, also uses a modular system, but it probably goes back more to Gothic architecture, as we'll see. Um, but his is so expressive. He's, he's uh, rejecting the rigidity, the clarity, um, the austerity of the modernist movement that came out of Germany in the interwar years, and instead is embracing a much more exuberant type of uh, design. And I think that's why it, it holds up so well today. Uh, tastes come and go. I mean, people like, you know, high Renaissance, very clear, rational design, and then sometimes they love overwrought Baroque. And these tastes go back and forth. But, but I think um, the really great works uh, stand, stand out and continue to have, uh, have power. And the design of Yamasaki combines both rationalism and expressionism. Expressionism, and I think that's why uh, that's why I love it so much, and I hope that it appeals to other people. 
Now, it's been called, uh, there's a, there's a, was a Wesleyan University student who wrote a long paper called S uh, Synagogue of Light, um, uh, because as you know, the sanctuary is so filled with light. Um, almost contemporary with North Shore is the Chicago Loop Synagogue by Chicago Synagogue's Lobo Schlossman and Bennett, who designed several synagogues in Chicago during the, from the late 1930s to the 1950s and 60s and beyond. Uh, and there it's famous for this great window, a project that I'm actually also working on trying to help the congregation save this window by Abraham Ratner, one of the great works of uh, 20th century Jewish art. Uh, but significantly, the, the window is called Let There Be Light. But in fact, that synagogue is very dark. It is, has, has very little natural light and it's on an urban site. So, so it's, it's, it's closed in. So the window says, let there be light. But as a, someone in the congregation, if you're attending a service there, you're saying, yes, yes, let me have light. Let me have light. And uh, that's not what we have at North Shore. North Shore certainly is a synagogue of light. This is a famous photograph by the great architectural photographer Balth Balthasar Korab, uh, whose works are now housed at the Library of Congress. And you can see in this exposure, he is emphasizing the, the brilliance of the light. And uh, the light comes from natural light. It comes from a combination of natural and artificial light. There are lots of light bulbs along the sides and up, which have been uh, really difficult to change over the years. And that's going to be uh, that, that's being changed in the in the, in the renovation uh, process, um, but also the concrete is not the raw concrete of many contemporary uh, architects uh, practicing what we've come to call brutalism. That is the raw concrete, brute um, uh, as raw, not as, as not as violent. Um, but it's painted; it's it, it's finished white, so that so the whole whole uh, building just shines and. Um, Light also comes in from the windows below. And this is really an innovation that we'll come back to uh, in the building. Uh, for centuries, synagogues had had the windows high up. And in fact, in the Middle Ages, Rabbi said, windows should, should, can only be high up so you can look at the sky, so you shouldn't be distracted when you're praying. Um, but also, they were high up for protection, for security. People couldn't break in the windows. Um, but uh, Yamasaki is one of just a few architects in the late 50s and early 60s who says, wait, 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 that's crazy. Let's open up the sanctuary to nature. And because the building was moved, as we will see, the original intent of the building uh, was for a more urban block, and then it was moved to this lakeside estate, uh, he was able to do that and open up these beautiful vistas uh, on, on either side of the building. And you see them through these slightly uh, gothic, these wide gothic uh, pointed uh, windows at, at the bottom. And it just uh, opens up the, the space so much. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful effect. But the light that comes through these, um, these filtered windows, which combine natural and artificial light from the top and from the sides, and the purely natural light from the lower ground level windows is very different. And they combine, but and combine, they give you a um, uh, a kind of layered effect of, of, of light and the meaning. And of course, light in Judaism is the greatest symbol of all. I mean, the beginning of creation is let there be light, but also light is illumination, the illumination of the Torah, the illumination of learning, of, of, of the ethical illumination of good works, good behavior. All of these things are so important um, that light, the, the ethereal quality of light the is, is almost, um, if I can say it without blaspheming, it's almost the equivalent of God itself, because God is ineffable. God is, is, uh, has no physical, no corporeal presence. So we think of God as, as light and air and uh, all around us. And of course, I think in the modern age, as we've embraced environmentalism, the meaning of uh, the importance of light and uh, uh, nature and, and, and plants and growth and providing uh, oxygen uh, and absorbing CO2, you know, all of this becomes much more uh, prevalent and important, none of which was in Yamasaki's mind, I'm sure, but all of which we can appreciate today because buildings go through meaning, different meanings over time. Now, um, there are other aspects in this building which are more historic, and even though it's, you know, undoubtedly modern and unlike anything we've ever seen before in the past, 
uh, it, it, it has echoes of different styles of architecture that Yamasaki loved very much. He went to Venice, fell in love with Venice, uh, the Gothic in Venice, just like John Ruskin did in the 19th century and then influenced generations of architects after him. Uh, Yamasaki also, uh, he was of Japanese heritage, he was born in Seattle, he's American, but he went to Japan, he designed um, buildings there and he traveled in Asia, he traveled all over the world. He absorbed these, these uh, 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 energies and he, he was very influenced by uh, Asian architecture as well. So if you take uh, Japanese architecture and Venetian architecture and you mix them all up, uh, you get something of his uh, unique style. Uh, so here we see what almost look like Gothic vaults, uh, fan vaults. And there's these little ogive arches, the pointed arches on the side, which suggest something vaguely Gothic. And again, for Jews, and again, I don't know that this was so important from Yamasaki's point of view because he doesn't talk about it, but he might've had a discussion with Rabbi Siskin. Um, we can look at the Altnoishul in Prague, which is the oldest continuously uh, used synagogue in the world. Uh, the building we look at today is from the 13th century and it's Gothic. It's, um, and, and you get some sense of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a relationship. These are distant, they're not brother and sister, but they're distant cousins. Uh, but the other Gothic um, uh, buildings that are not Jewish are also just as influential. So this is the great church of St. Francis in Assisi of the upper church, also from the 13th century. And you can just get a sense of the feel, the space, uh, the, the light, the wall, um, all of these things. Uh, are foundational uh, for, for, for Yamasaki. And this is uh, Lincoln Cathedral in, uh, in England and you get some sense uh, with this very wide angle picture uh, of how spacious uh, the, the, these buildings are and how the vaults allow this continuous um, uh, opening down the middle, the nave of the, of the cathedral. And we have the wide hall, if you will, in, the, in, in North Shore uh, Sanctuary. Um, of course, these buildings, most of these had stained glass and uh, uh, Yamasaki doesn't want stained glass. He wants natural light. And that's very important. Uh, he wasn't the only architect who insisted on that. Uh, he's following in the um, path of Eric Mendelssohn, the great modernist and refugee architect who also combined rational, a rational style and an expressionist style and came to America as a refugee from Nazi Germany and did design six synagogues, uh, a few of which were completed in his lifetime. The most complete uh, and still extant is Park Synagogue in Cleveland. Uh, and he also was a great believer in the, in the power of natural light and that he wasn't a religious Jew, but he felt that the light, natural light was the essence of, of the essential expression of God. And if architects wanted to express God's presence, they should do it by including as much light as they can. So here's another comparison, just these broad windows and uh, uh, a vault in, in North Shore here, they're concrete of course, and at Bath Cathedral, they're all of carved stone, uh, but you see that these are, these are related. So Yamasaki isn't just designing something out of whole cloth. He, is a, he has absorbed the history of, of, of world architecture but he's, he does embrace historical elements in a way that people like Mies van der Rohe or Walter Gropius um, did not. They rejected, Corbusier, they, these modernists, they rejected uh, wholesale the historicism and the styles and even the technologies and materials of the past, uh, but, but, but Yamasaki is willing to make room for them. He, he feels there is a marriage that can be made between modernism and, 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 and historicism. Um, he says, my premise, my premise is, I have to move, I can't read. My premise is that the light and reflection are ingredients that which must be added. Sunlight and shadow, form, ornament, and element of surprise are little explored fields barely understood by today's architect. So he's not just trying to do a grid, he's trying to make something much more. And here we see um, another uh, medieval synagogue. This is a print. Uh, from Regensburg, Germany of a 13th century synagogue. It was deliberately destroyed. Actually, the artist of this print, Alfred Altdorfer, was one of the people who actually, he was on the town council, advocated for the destruction. Um, and 
he, um, uh, but, but you can see there is a, a kind of relationship, a, a historical similarity. And then back at the Alt Neuschel, you can see in the Bema, the metal Bema, uh, which is uh, down in the lower left of this photo, that the metal work actually is very close in its shape to the window shapes uh, on, the, on the sides of, of, of North Shore. Uh, so how did, how did this built? Um, it wasn't built like a medieval cathedral, really. It wasn't built like uh, a medieval synagogue, but it was built using some of the same kinds of system, a modular system. And also um, there were two main phases of construction. Uh, the first was poured concrete, cast concrete in a wooden mold. And there are eight sections. And so these were these were repeated. So you're not rebuilding, you're not building a whole form for the whole building, but you're casting it in sequence. And this is exactly how medieval cathedrals were built. They built them bay by bay, square by square, usually starting from the, the east end, but sometimes from the west. But, but um, and that's why you often, if you go to a very old cathedral, you'll see there are breaks uh, in style after so many, um, so many bays because they would run out of money and they would have to wait 50 years. And I should say that uh, the, 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 there was a phase one and a phase two at North Shore Congregation Israel and uh, the, the cost overruns in this project were considerable and therefore phase two had to wait really 18 years to be completed. So the building which the, the building committee had originally hoped would be finished by 1960 uh, was finished in 1964. Uh, but much of the actual uh, uh, complex, of course, wasn't completed until the 1980s. Anyway, it's very big and Yamasaki describes the building in detail, but it's 50 feet high, 80 feet wide and 126 feet long with eight pairs of this cast in place concrete fan vault shell. And then uh, into this shell were inserted 12 by 40 foot precast wall pa panels. And these were delivered to the site. And I don't know if this is one of the reasons of the cast of the cost overrun, but certainly it would have affected the, the building schedule. Uh, he writes that uh, one of these fell while they were installing them and it broke and it revealed that critical reinforcing steel was missing from the curved areas. And after discussing this with the contractor and the engineers um, who wanted to test the remaining panels, he just said, no, just, make all new ones and make them stronger because we don't want to risk them cracking once they're in place, given Michigan, uh, given Illinois uh, uh, weather. Um, and, and that probably added uh, a considerable time to the project. He says the aesthetic totality of any beautiful thing, such as a lovely plant, is in its concept, its structure, or its tiniest detail. So even though on the one hand, this is repetitive and seems to be form work, the detail work is exquisite. Uh, I liked these windows, um, these fan vaults, because I see lots of things in them. And I see a kind of Art Nouveau fluidity, this kind of plant-like uh, element. And I'm reminded of uh, these Tiffany uh, lamps with the dragon wings. And I think you can see that kind of relationship. And then of course, uh, the Tiffany um, uh, flower vases also to me, Kind of suggests these the curves and the and the elongated uh, vaults. Um, there's something very you know this attenuated, um, soft, uh, almost melting feel that is uh, very uh, very um, I think very appealing. Very rather than this hard brutality. And here we see in the arc as well the calla lily and all of these things together. So this is the building as it's getting made. There you see the panels which have been put in place. You see it does look very raw and concrete. It hardly looks the white shining building that most of us are familiar with, uh, or sometimes it's been painted cream, I think as well. Um, uh, these are my pictures from just a few months ago, so it is a little creamier. Um, and then the windows uh, are clear in parts and then they're also uh, tinted and then uh, also, depending if the lights are working behind, you get more or less light. But eventually with the, with, with the replacement of all these bulbs with LED lights, it will be more consistent lighting and it won't be so difficult to, to change them. Um, there are interesting plan elements. He put uh, platforms on the sides as a way of expanding seating. And then also you can open into the Memorial Hall in the front. 
And then here we see it, you know, totally uh, beautifully uh, in the landscape. Okay, so very quickly, we have about uh, 15 minutes, I think. Um, I want to give you a little history. So most of you know some of this history because you're congregants, but you know that in the early 1920s, a new congregation, only about 46 uh, families, I believe, um, settled on the North Shore. It was the first time Jews were moving up there. And uh, they originally were affiliated with Temple Sinai in Chicago, but it was too long, too far to go, even for Reformed Jews who don't have to walk to Shoal. And they uh, eventually set up their own congregation. Um, Alfred Altshuler Jr. Uh, was, uh, sorry, Alfred Altshuler was the, uh, was a member of the congregation, founding member, I believe, and he came up with designs for the building. He had previously designed, uh, just recently, the, uh, the uh, Temple Isaiah, which is now KEM Isaiah Israel, the big Byzantine uh, synagogue that I'll show you in a minute. It was a very stripped down Byzantine design that he chose. Um, and it's still you, some of you, many of you have visited this because it's now another, another congregation. Um, so this compares it to the, the, the KM Isaiah Israel, um, which is somewhat more ornate. Um, so there's a kind of modernist feel, uh, beginning to, uh, impact and also actually in his commercial work was much more uh, was quite progressive in the sense of embracing modernism. So the Byzantine style was more uh, specific to, to synagogue architecture because he was also studying the archeological excavations in, in uh, then Palestine and finally uh, interested in the synagogues that were being discovered. So he drew on Christian architectural sources, uh, San Vitale in Ravenna, Hagia Sophia in, in, um, in uh, Istanbul. So in the same way that uh, I think more overtly than Yamasaki drew on those Gothic elements that I showed you before. Um, but uh, Rabbi Siskin uh, uh, wanted something different. He wanted something very new. He didn't want something Byzantine. He didn't want something historicist. Uh, he wanted something uh, that is clean, simple, graceful, but touched by warmth and inspiration, which is old and hallowed. Um, but is new, essentially. Um, he didn't want a starkly functional structure, a sterile box or a series of boxes. He saw it as a building which soared, lifting its head above the surrounding landscape, but not flamboyantly in conflict with the surrounding architectural and natural forms. So this is all written, I should say, before the building was built. So this is from the meeting minutes of the Architectural Selection Committee summarizing Rabbi Siskin's charged them. This is what they were supposed to find. They were supposed to find an architect who could meet these demands. And Henry Goldstein, who was the executive director of the temple and wrote a long memo all about the, 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 what a synagogue is and what it means, he felt that the ark should be the center of attention of the congregation. Uh, the building was a house of worship and that the entire focus of attention should be through the ark, which is the resting place of Jewish law. So these two men uh, working with a very active and informed uh, building committee, uh, you know, push push the designs. Um, he had this large vision, which I've already I've already uh, quoted in in part. Um, and this is Goldstein, just the beginning of this this long memo. But he starts an architect stands always at the beginning of Genesis. Every synagogue he creates must go through the pangs of its own birth, struggling to become, striving to emerge out of the chaotic mass of modern moods and traditional background. It starts very poetic and inspirational. And then it gets very, very practical, you know, because he's a he's a he's a he's a, an administrator. So he really tells you what you've got to do. This is we can't can't all be poetry, it can't all be lyrical prayer. It's it's got to be nuts and bolts as well. So they want an architect who is both a poet, if you will, and inspired and humble and also a great businessman and organizer and good with finance and all those kinds of things. And they begin to interview lots of architects. Um, first, the committee goes and visits a few buildings that are underway and Frank Lloyd Wright's now famous synagogue in Elkins Park, Beth Shalom was still being completed. It was finished that year, 1959 actually. And, um, and so they go there and look at that. They probably talk with Mortimer Cohen who was the rabbi in the driving force there. And, you know, they're, I'm sure they were impressed by this giant tent or mountain of light. Um, and certainly um, some of this, this power is felt in, in, the, in the Yamasaki building. And I think 
now, 60 years later, um, more than that, uh, if people single out the two most architecturally distinctive uh, and impressive and influential and uh, debated uh, synagogue buildings of, of, the, of the second half of the 20th century, uh, it's always Frank Lloyd Wright's Beth Shalom and Minori Yamasaki's uh, North Shore Congregation in Israel. Um, it's not for nothing that I put it on the cover of my book 20 years ago, and probably that in itself has, has helped it or encouraged people to uh, pay attention to the building. So um, Alfred Altshuler Jr., the son of the architect who designed KAM Isaiah Israel, was a member of this congregation and did the, he and his firm, um, Friedman, Altshuler, and Sincere had done the 1950s edition, an early 50s edition, and, but, but, the congregation decided, the building committee and the rabbi decided explicitly to take all local architects out of the running in the competition because there would be too much conflict. They, 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 they recognized the contribution of the Altshuler family and designated Friedman, Altshuler, and Sincere as the local architect, the architect of record doing the work on site, but the design architect was had to be out of town. And that was because there was, it seems there were a lot of architects in this congregation and everyone kind of wanted a crack at this project. And if they chose one over the other, there was going to be big, big problems. Um, so it's an amazing list of architects. Um, one could do a whole paper just on this list. I'm gonna run through some of their works very quickly uh, because time is about up. Um, but you know, Paul Williams, who is one of the few black architects working in America, uh, there were, there were uh, major, um, uh, all the major modernists, very few overtly Jewish architects. And it's interesting who's not on the list, the three most prolific Jewish architects, Sigmund Braverman, Sigmund Braverman from Cleveland and um, uh, uh, Percival Goodman, who I already mentioned, uh, and uh, Sidney Eisenstadt from Los Angeles. These are three, they're all doing synagogues, but none of them are on Altshuler or Siskin's list. Uh, and and it, it's quite it's quite clear. but they are going for the high profile ar architects whose works are on the front of of architecture magazines and who are in the New York Times and you know that kind of thing. So they're they're going out of the Jewish architectural what they might see as almost a ghetto, and they're they're looking at the broad big 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 scene. Um, so significantly, Yamasaki and Frank Lloyd Wright and and um, Pietro Belushi. A lot of these architects are not Jewish. Their name architects and, and, and synagogues like to get them uh, for prestige, but also um, people like Siskin who want an architect who will think outside of the box may be looking for people, actually think it's a, to their credit, people who have not designed synagogues before. They figure, well, Altshuler can help with the functional details because he knows synagogues, but let's get Yamasaki to get the, a big new idea, big new idea. Okay, that's my. Um, so it's interesting, one name on the list, it's spelled incorrectly, is Richard Neutra. And I found that, um, I don't think they knew this. This is not mentioned that I can tell in any of the minutes, but uh, I haven't, I've only had seen selected passages from the minutes that your wonderful archivist, uh, Merle um, Brenner has sent to me. But um, I knew this before, there's an unbuilt design that, uh, Neutra did in 1924 for North Shore Temple, which I believe was what became North Shore Congregation Israel when they first uh, were founded. So this is was not built. Uh, I think this was an unsolicited design. He had just come to America and was uh, looking for work. And he'd come to work with Frank Lloyd Wright, um, but he had Jewish connections. So he was trying to to do some work. In the end, Neutra never designed a synagogue. He submitted two different synagogue designs in the 1920s, both of which were rejected because they were too radically modernist. And uh, he, he then went and designed houses and other kinds of things out in Southern California. Uh, but, but he was on, he was on uh, Altshuler's list. Um, very high on the list was Eero Saarinen, who they were very interested in. And Rabbi Siskin actually went and met with Saarinen in, in, um, in uh, Detroit. Uh, and Saren, of course, was riding high with his, with his uh, uh, work, his expressionist work. And most famous is the TWA terminal, which was completed in 1961 at Kennedy Airport. Um, it's actually a good thing that uh, they didn't choose Saren because Saren died um, 
1961, I think. So he uh, he wouldn't have lasted out this, this project. Um, but these are some of Saradin buildings and you could see they are very different, very organic. Uh, they're, they're, they're very exciting. And, um, and they seem to have appealed to, to, to Siskin. Um, Kivett and Myers in, in Kansas City were just at this time building uh, B'nai Yehuda and which has since been torn down sadly. Uh, but Kivett came and brought drawings to show what they were doing in Kansas City. But Kivett said to them, uh, you know, you don't really need an out of town architect. You've got so many people here, just get someone from the congregation. And he, he was, I think he was telling them to save money and make it easier. Uh, he said, I'll be consulting architect on a per diem basis if you want, but, but you don't really need to do all of this stuff. And in fact, they thought about doing a, a competition, but they decided that would be too expensive and it would take too long but they did uh, begin to interview people on this list. They, they interviewed Breuer, Marcel Breuer, um, the great, uh, the refugee uh, Jewish, but not practicing architect, uh, been active at the Bauhaus in Germany and was teaching at Harvard. Um, and he had done one synagogue. He just completed the Westchester Reform Temple in Scarsdale, which you see here with its Jewish star plan. And he was building another one, which never was completed in Short Hills, uh, New Jersey. Um, Breuer's work, though, is very, you know, big and bold and brutal, uh, you know, very awe-inspiring, but not very welcoming to me, to, in my mind, uh, for a uh, intimate communal religious space. It makes uh, temple, uh, it makes North Shore's uh, sanctuary, which has been described as overpowering and awesome, seem positively, uh, positively intimate. Uh, so Breuer uh, wasn't chosen. One of the reasons th these architects, Edward Dorrell Stone here, uh, who was doing embassy work around the world and is also known, he'd just done the, <laughs> finished the Huntington Hartford Museum in New York the year before. Um, these, these architects just, their schedules were too busy. So they said, well, we're interested, but we can't even get to this for a year or two. And the congregation really wanted to rush this forward. As it is, um, it didn't rush forward. Uh, Pietro Belusi, who was the dean of uh, MIT, and he was just designing the Temple Brith Kodesh in Rochester, and he said he would he couldn't get involved, but he would be happy to advise or look at look over anything that they you know they had. Um, Harrison and Abramowitz, they had done the Hillel at Northwestern, which people uh, in Glencoe knew well. Um, they would go on to build this synagogue in Buffalo, which is highly expressionist and in some ways, you know, is a stepchild of North Shore, uh, but they hadn't built anything like this yet at the time. They thought uh, they could talk to Philip Johnson. They said who built many synagogues. In fact, Johnson only designed this synagogue in uh, Port Chester, New York, a uh, very rational, very modular. Um, actually, he adopted a church design that he had previously Built. They also had Morris Lapidus on the list, who famous for the Fontainebleau Hotel, and uh, he just was working on this synagogue in St. Petersburg, Florida, and uh, would then go on to build these other synagogues in the a few years uh, following. Um, Helmut Obata and Kasselbaum doing work in St. Louis. So they went through a lot, but they didn't talk to a uh, personal good men, who you can see like Yamasaki likes this uh, a concrete shell design at Beth Shalom in Miami. And they didn't talk to Jewish architect Sidney Eisenstadt. Perhaps he was too religious. Although this is a reform synagogue in Texas, Eisenstadt himself was probably the most observant Jewish architect of his, of his day. Um, so he was also very knowledgeable, Jewishly knowledgeable. In the end, they chose Yamasaki. Uh, they found him uh, articulate and humble and, and, and eager and philosophical and poetic and eager, he was very eager to do this and he could make it on his schedule and he invited them to his big office in Detroit. They toured it, they were impressed. They toured many of his other buildings. He was most famous for the Lampert Airport Terminal from 1956, which he'd won many awards for and which sort of set the template for American architecture at airports. But you can see there's a hint of what he's gonna be doing even at North Shore when you look at these continuous vaults and the thin shell vaults, it's the same kind of uh, concrete design. Okay, so to conclude, because we're at time, um, 
there was a change in plans because originally the building was going to be designed as part of the existing complex. And it was going to be squeezed into essentially an urban, more urban neighborhood bounded by streets. And the congregation already went and bought properties to allow this to happen. And then the opportunity came up to purchase this large estate, the Stonehill estate um, that had been designed by David Adler, uh, an early Jewish architect in Chicago. And this was the first of his houses on the North Shore. Uh, it was purchased, uh, I think it was 18 or 19 acres. It was then demolished and then construction began. And here you see the concrete, the progress on the poured concrete, uh, these wonderful vaults. And there they really do look like calla lilies. And it begins getting semi-dedicated, but it takes many years. It's not till 1964 that it's finally completed. And then it is has a reputation because it is exhibited in the 1963 exhibition at the Jewish Museum on um, uh, recent American synagogues. And significantly, uh, it is called uh, still another and perhaps the most beautiful of the exhibit is Minoru Yamasaki Sanctuary for the North Shore Congregation Israel in Glencoe. So even in 1963, before it was built, just looking at the model and photos of the model, um, it was already de deemed uh, as, as, as something most beautiful and it's, and it's kept, that, kept that reputation. Um, so to close, the influence is uh, hard to say uh, because there's also sort of a zeitgeist, a lot of other building of that type using new materials, concrete and kind of modular approach uh, was being done at the time. There are some interesting similar buildings, this one in Italy by the Jewish architect Angelo Di Castro in Livorno, uh, which is both a tabernacle and kind of an ark, kind of carrying the remnants of what's left of Judaism after the war. And one of my favorites is uh, the little known uh, B'nai Israel Synagogue in Woonsocket uh, by uh, the Jewish architect Stanley Glazer, completed in 1962. So these were completed before the completion of North Shore, but North Shore's design was already known from 1959, 1960. So it influenced these places. And then the green architecture has had an influence to this day. And this is just up the road from you in Evanston. And this is the Reconstructionist congregation. And this idea of opening up the sanctuary to greenery, um, that's something I think come, that comes out of North Shore as well. Yamasaki built one more synagogue in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, which you see here. And there's comparing the two uh, interiors. And I think time is up. So I'm at the end of my presentation. So thank you. Uh, very much for uh, for listening. And I know I went through a lot of things very quickly, but uh, feel free to use uh, the method set up. Uh, you can communicate with me and uh, ask questions, and I can also uh, point you in directions to read uh, or watch more. So uh, good luck and good fortune enjoying this wonderful, uh, wonderful building for years to come. Dr. Gruber, on behalf of all of us here who were lucky enough to listen to and learn from you uh, for the past 40 minutes or so, we are so uh, grateful. Thank you. Um, you. It is incredible, the insights you have to offer. Um, and I'll just say, I'll speak personally and say that um, being able to see uh, our our large sanctuary space in particular uh, and how it has interacted with um, other, other uh, spaces, other significant spaces contemporary to itself uh, in the past and then understanding how uh, it responds and maybe influences or has shaped what, what has come now from it um, was, was so, so inspiring and uh, in many ways humbling uh, and, and uh, I know I speak for all of us again uh, in gratitude to you for sharing your wisdom and your interest. We are so grateful to you. Um, as we transition now, I'll just reflect that I have often in particular over the last few years found myself in imaginary conversation with Yamasaki and with Rabbi Siskin in particular wondering uh, what they might 
uh, have to say about this uh, modern reality in which we now find ourselves living? What if they uh, had been alive now? What sort of spaces would they have created? Uh, what shifts uh, might have influenced their decisions uh, in the creation of a synagogue or in the place where we are now in uh, the thinking of adapting our synagogue even more. Uh, and although I don't know that their priorities necessarily would have changed, um, it, it is certainly interesting to ask the question, you know, what does inspiration and dreaming and imagination and light uh, and this idea of evoking holiness um, how might all of those uh, sort of directions be manifested in whatever we might create in our world today? And quite frankly, I often wonder what would they think of this reality that we live in where security now takes a place uh, in a completely different way uh, than most, uh, certainly most Jewish communities have had to think about in America. Um, over the last hundred years, right? So um, as we move forward, I just invite everyone who's here to sort of um, bring everything that we've just learned into this idea of moving forward, right? And, and understanding that as times change, needs change, needs evolve, reality evolves, but we are still invited to uh, inspire, to imagine, um, to, to figure out ways to evoke and speak to uh, our, our natural yearning for the sacred with the understanding that the ways that those things might manifest themselves change, uh, change over time and continue to change over time. One of the beautiful, um, beautiful aspects of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, one of these uh, potential inspiration points of our large sanctuary was the idea that it was a space that was created uh, to meet the people's needs, to be established to meet the people's needs wherever they found themselves along the course of their journey. Uh, and as such, it was nimble and in many ways dynamic and responsive. Um, I'd like to think of that as the heart of the spirit of what North Shore Congregation Israel has always been about. Uh, and am most delighted to say that that's really what has guided our process, uh, in particular in the Imagine the Possible campaign. So with no further ado, it's my pleasure to turn it over now to Matt Wiley. Uh, we're really excited to see your presentation. Matt, thank you so much for being with us. Um, thank you, Rabbi. It's, it's, it's truly my pleasure to be here. And I, I'd like to start out by saying it's a privilege to be entrusted with something so precious. And your congregation has been gifted with a precious site. And as we just learned from Dr. Gruber, a, a marvelous building. Um, and it's become a place to ask the big questions, explore big ideas, and a place to seek that divine spark that's in every person. And, and you are the caretakers of this precious place and have the opportunity to preserve its relevance in, into coming generations. So you've been fortunate to have worked with other designers who knew their work had to be deeply grounded in the place and its people to endure. And when they responded to your call, uh, each in their different architectural language to satisfy the needs and the psyche of that time, one that we just learned about uh, was modern and monumental, expressive and daylit, flowing and botanical, and the other, uh, the Perlman Building, historically grounded, planted, reverential, inwardly focused, and communal. Um, and their varied spatial offerings are literally markers of your congregation's growth and history, uh, fixed expressions of a moment in the life of the congregation. And though these buildings were intended to last for years, it's inevitable that they each need to change to remain relevant and useful for the lives of the people of today and reflect the evolving personality of your congregation. So the big question for us as designers becomes, what must we do uh, to enter into an active dialogue with your storied buildings? So um, as far as the scope of our work, we've been asked to suggest design 
and functional improvements to Frank and Crown Hall to consolidate the staff into a single collaborative office environment, uh, repurpose the current rabbi suite, uh, improve security at key entry points of the building, and then to create exterior spaces in the South Lawn that extend this design outdoors to take advantage of the landscape. Um, so let's take a look at what we've been doing. And I'm gonna start by bringing up um, uh, some imagery of a reimagined uh, Frank Hall, which hopefully you are all able to see on the screen now. Uh, today, Frank Hall is a singular large space, brightly lit with great views to the north and the south and its central location makes it an ideal spot for many functions. However, it's not permanently furnished or appointed to, to do that. Uh, the image on the screen is a depiction of what's possible, not what will be in a remodeled uh, Frank Hall. Um, in its transformed state uh, at Frank Hall, we would hope to create a central gathering place that welcomes congregants into fellowship, um, learning, reflection, or celebration. Uh, and to accomplish this, the redesigned space will become reconceived as truly multi-purpose, flexible space, capable of being configured and then quickly reconfigured as the needs demand. Most days, Frank Hall may be arranged to invite folks in for a conversation and a cup of coffee or tea, you know, a casual place to reconnect with friends throughout the week. But at other times, the space may be reconfigured by using a thoughtful combination of furniture and some mobile dividers into several more intimate spaces to uh, gather, learn, or study quietly. In addition to dividing the space, these mobile dividers can provide needed storage for education materials, uh, some portable furnishings. Uh, they can replace the uh, coat spaces that you have in the synagogue now depending on the need, maybe even display um, art uh, that's part of the collection. Of course, during high holidays, the space will still be able to be opened up to the sanctuary to accommodate uh, overflow holiday seating. Um, the next space that we're addressing is Crown Hall. Today, Crown Hall is the um, primary space for large gatherings. Uh, and celebrations at Northhurst. So let's take a look at that. Um, so on the screen, you see an image of the reimagined Crown Hall. And to assure that it continues to be effective in its role for large gatherings, <clears throat> our design work so far has identified the following objectives. One is to refresh its interior palette using brighter, more varied finishes with some subtle color and added pattern and texture. Uh, to improve its comfort by replacing the exterior windows, increasing the lighting level and lighting controls, and by exploring and expanding access to the exterior. Uh, we'd like to extend its functionality by offering fuller access to contemporary technology uh, and address the acoustical performance, enhancing uh, the ease of use of the room and enabling a wider variety of uh, media to be used in the space. Among the design elements we're considering that you see on the screen to achieve these goals are a series of gently uh, dropped ceiling uh, panels to create a subtle variety in height uh, that provides some hierarchy in the room and reinforces the symmetry of the original architecture. Um, to re-envision the end panels that are at the north and south ends, enhance their decorative quality, uh, but also improving the acoustics in the room. And as you can see, we're looking at creating openings to the outside, in addition to upgrades to uh, the wood floor and the carpeting. Um, when finished, the space should feel refreshed but, and comfortable, but, but familiar to you. Uh, and through those doors in Crown Hall, let's step outside and take a look at um, what, what I'm calling the South Lawn Terrace. This new exterior space will bring life to the lawn east of Crown Hall uh, by embracing its natural beauty and creating a place for quiet enjoyment, social activities, and play. Uh, when complete, we imagine a variety of settings within the larger terrace, 
including intimate places to enjoy lake breezes in the shade, uh, some lushly planted gardens to wander, and then a large sunny terrace to relax and read or simply enjoy the sunshine. Um, it's located to the east and through the new glass wall of Crown Hall uh, and will serve as an easily accessible extension of the celebrations hosted in Crown Hall. Um, sized to accept a large tent structure, the terrace will expand and embellish the capacity and variety of celebrations that can be hosted. Uh, if you look back into the, into the depth of the image, you'll see the sukkah um, as design work on the South Lawn Terrace progressed, it became pretty apparent that the areas surrounding the sukkah might want to be included in the scope of our work. And we're giving this strong consideration for several reasons. One, um, it's in a location um, that can provide direct access to the South Lawn Terrace from the gallery corridor without going through Crown Hall. So there is a practical reason. The space is directly connected to all the other spaces that we're working on, Frank Hall, the administrative area, Crown Hall. And by enhancing this, we enhance the work that we're doing in other, uh, all of those other places. And then because of its sheltered location, it's a natural space for uh, a small garden for some quiet reflection. So though the design of this newly considered area is not as advanced as the other areas we've shown in these renderings, uh, we are excited about what this might bring to the final uh, exterior design. So as you can see, we've been hard at work over the past couple months. There's much design work and development of these areas yet to come. Um, following today's event, we're looking forward to expanding and exploring these ideas, making them real, and writing the next chapter in the design history of North Shore Congregation Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, Matt, and Wendy, for taking time to be with us this morning and to share your knowledge and your insights. It has been fascinating and inspiring. I've learned so much and I have a greater appreciation of NSCI and I look forward to future enhancements. As longtime members, NSCI has been an important part of my family's life. We have shared a valuable relationship with NSCI built over many years of treasured memories, holidays, life cycle events, some joyous, some bittersweet, but the knowledge that the congregation has been there for us was and is comforting. Our family is forever grateful to NSCI for all they have to offer. And we look forward to an exciting future. To that end, I'm excited to share that to date, the Imagine the Possible campaign has raised $10.5 million from over 220 families. However, we still have to raise $2 million. And we're hoping that every congregant will feel inspired to contribute. In the coming weeks, you will be receiving a beautiful and informative brochure detailing the full scope of the Imagine the Possible campaign. It will include meaningful opportunities for you and your family to participate to the best of your ability. My family and I have made a commitment to Imagine the Possible, and I invite you to join us in making Imagine the Possible a reality. Let's come together as a community to help NSCI continue to continue to be a place to worship, gather, and learn for generations to come. Lador Vador, from one generation to another. Please keep in mind that while we will bring the campaign to an end shortly, you have the opportunity to pay your gift over four years. If you have questions, the campaign leadership would be pleased to meet with you. You can reach out through our executive director, Todd Brayman. Thank you all for joining us and thank you to Susan Longo for helping to conceptualize today's program. Enjoy the rest of your day and happy Pesach. <laughs>